Today we're in chapter 20. We're going to be looking at verses 19 through 26. So let's begin reading together here in Luke chapter 20 at verse 19. I'll read to uh, verse 26 and we'll get into our study. Luke chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. Luke writes, And the chief priests and the scribes that very hour sought to lay hands on him. But they feared the people, for they knew he had spoken this parable against them. So they watched him and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. Then they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? But he perceived the craftiness and said to them, Why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? They answered and said, Caesar's. And he said to them, Render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. But they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer and kept silent. And so what we have here is a continuation of the antagonism that has been demonstrated towards Jesus Christ uh, by the religious leadership. And these are people who are bent on bringing Jesus Christ down. These are people who are strategizing how they may do so. They've been desiring to have him put to death for the longest time. John had told us that it began really in earnest when he had healed a crippled man on the Sabbath, and, and it's been continuing ever since then. And now, in recent times, Jesus had done some things that really got him upset. He had, he had healed and continued to be healing on the Sabbath, but he had, in recent days, he had cleansed the temple, and he had entered in, actually had entered in on Palm Sunday and cleansed the temple, and that had gotten them greatly upset. And, and he had recently raised a man from the dead, a man by the name of Lazarus, and as a result of that, many people had begun to believe in Jesus Christ because of that particular miracle. In chapter 12 of John's gospel, I'll read this to you. In John chapter 12, it says uh, in verses 10 and 11, the chief priests plotted to put Lazarus to death also because on account of him, many of the Jews went away and believed in Jesus. And so they were greatly upset at the fact that Jesus Christ was, was, was well-respected and followed by many people, and they've been designing to put him to death for some time. Matthew tells us concerning this in chapter 22, if you take notes, it's found in Matthew 22, verses 15 and 16, that the Pharisees went and plotted how they might entangle him in his talk. And they sent to him their disciples with the Herodians. And so what we actually have, according to Matthew, is a, an alliance that has been formed between Pharisees and Herodians. So instead of them taking to heart the words that the Lord Jesus Christ has been speaking, they have made a determination all the more to, to resist him. And instead of being convicted um, because of their sins, uh, they now reject him and they're rejecting his message. Jesus has been ministering to them, and that's what blows my mind as I, I look at all of these chapters that we've studied together here in the Gospel of Luke, and he's been ministering to them and teaching them and, and, and doing some incredible things, and, and yet instead of them being open to what God can do, they, they are rejecting him. They're hardening themselves against him. They're resisting him. They're strategizing how they can entangle him in his words. They're, they're trying to find a way that they might be able to put him to death, and not only Jesus, but they'd love to put uh, others to death who are followers, including Lazarus. The Bible tells us in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 15, as has been said, today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your hearts as you did in the rebellion. If you have a, an opportunity to hear and to respond, and the writer of Hebrews would say, then respond. Don't be in that state of rebellion. You hear what God's saying? Respond to him. Stop rejecting him. Stop resisting him. So many times people will hear a message and hear a message and hear it again and just constantly harden their hearts against it. How many times have you been to church where you've heard a message, you've read the passage for yourself, you've heard a message, it has spoken to you, it has convicted you, and, and maybe there in that pew, there in your seat, you, you're saying, you know, this is true, I have to do something about it. But the minute you walk out, you go right back to what you've been doing. You harden your heart. Well, that's what took place here. They have hardened their hearts. They've, they've seen the works that Jesus has done. 
They, they saw the works of power that he's done. They've heard the message that he's been giving. They saw his authority as he, as he entered into the city of Jerusalem there on the foal of that donkey. They, they saw the, the, the people there as they were crying out Hosanna to Jesus Christ. And, and instead of joining in with that happy throng, those people who were crying out praises to him, they actually went so far as to tell Jesus to silence his disciples. They just could not hear what the Spirit was saying. They hardened their hearts. They wanted nothing to do with it. And so instead of responding, they're plotting against him. And so what they do is they get together, these Pharisees, with a group of people called Herodians, and they, as Matthew had said, they, they plot how they might entangle him in his talk. Now, when Matthew said that they were trying to entangle, that word entangle means to ensnare or entrap. It, it's a word that was used to speak of trapping birds. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to elicit from Jesus a remark that can be turned into an accusation against him. And so they're watching him. That's what we see in verse 20 here in Luke chapter 20. It says, they watched him and, and sent spies who pretended to be righteous that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. And so they're, they're not taking direct action. Notice that with me. The reason is because they fear the people. Uh, for them, it would be wiser, it would be easier to get Rome to make a move on Jesus Christ. And, and so they have formed an alliance, even as we read a moment ago in Matthew 22. An alliance has been formed uh, with the Pharisees and the Herodians. Now, when you study your New Testament, you know that Pharisees were looked at as being uh, very religious. They had a reputation for spirituality. But the Herodians did not have a reputation for being spiritual. The Herodians actually had a, a reputation of being worldly. They were called Herodians because they were loyal to Herod Antipas. Herod Antipas was the one who imprisoned and killed John the Baptist. And these Herodians were people who actually gave their allegiance to Rome because Rome had granted them power. Normally, Pharisees and Herodians would be antagonistic towards one, toward one another, but, but now they have joined forces. They've united against Jesus Christ. It's that old saying, the enemy of my enemy is my friend, and that's what you have here. You have two antagonistic groups that normally would be at, at odds with one another, who normally would be Antag antagonistically opposed to one another, but now they have formed an alliance. And, and they are forming this alliance because it's been made clear that Herod Antipas would like to kill Jesus Christ. Remember in chapter 13 here in the Gospel of Luke, do you remember at verse 31 where we had read some Pharisees came saying to Jesus, get out and depart from here, for Herod wants to kill you. Well, the Herodians and the, and the Pharisees now are joining forces and as they join forces, that joining of the Pharisees and Herodians actually will add credibility to the charge that they're about to form. Because everybody knows that Herodians and Pharisees don't get along, and therefore if they're united over something, there must be some truth to their accusation. And so what they're doing is they're, they're trying to entrap Jesus. And notice they're trying to trap Jesus through the things that Jesus Christ has been saying. That's what they're trying to do. They're trying to entangle him in his talk. They're like uh, seasoned politicians, if you will. They, they expect him to say something that they can use to turn against him. All you have to do, and we know this, it's a political year, and we see this already, all you have to do is follow somebody around with a camera long enough and record everything they're saying, and before you know it, you'll discover that they say one thing to this crowd and they say something else to another. These are seasoned politicians, and so they're basically thinking that they can entangle Jesus in the things that he's saying. You see, the Proverbs in Proverb, uh, Proverbs 10, verse 19 says, In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking, but he who restrains his lips is wise. They figure that if Jesus speaks long enough, he's going to say something they can catch him uh, with and, and use as an accusation against him. It, it's what the psalmist is talking about in Psalm 56, verses 5 and 6, when he says, All day they twist my words. All their thoughts are against me for evil. They gather together. They hide they mark my steps when they lie in wait for me. So all day they twist my words, their thoughts against me 
are for evil. That's what's taking place here, and so they're trying to catch Jesus Christ, and so they're doing so under the guise of being righteous. Notice, notice how it says, verse 20, they watched him, sent spies who pretended to be righteous, that they might seize on his words in order to deliver him to the power and the authority of the governor. They're hoping he's going to say something that can get a capital charge lodged against him, and ultimately we know that we'll be seeing that is exactly what they do. And so in verse 21, what do they do? Well, it says they asked him, saying, Teacher, we know that you say and teach rightly, and you do not show personal favoritism, but teach the way of God in truth. Is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Now, when they say to him, Teacher, notice verse 21, Teacher, that's a title of honor. It's a title of honor that is reserved for distinguished rabbis. And so what they're doing is they're beginning their conversation with Jesus by using flattery. I was taught a long time ago, never believe anything or everything people say to you. Never believe the, the bad things they say because you're probably not that bad. And never believe the good they say about you because you most certainly aren't that good. You're normally somewhere in between. And so when somebody comes and uses flattery, you can immediately know that this isn't something good. Proverbs 29, 5 says, whoever flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for his feet. And that's the absolute truth. And that's why we, we pray Psalm 120, verse 2, deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. Because people will use flattery. They will try to find a way to um, get you to the point where they can... They can deceive you into believing something or to do something that ultimately they're going to be able to use against you. That does happen, and so they're setting a trap here. Notice how they say it. They say, we know that you say and teach rightly and that you're impartial. That's basically what they're saying. In other words, you have a reputation. You have a great reputation of not adding to or taking away from God's Word. That's basically what they're saying here. You see, in the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, in chapter 4, verse 2, God had made a command. He had said, You shall not add to the word which I command you, nor take away from it, that you may keep the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you. And so they're basically saying to Jesus, You are a wonderful teacher. You're a distinguished rabbi. You do not show partiality. You teach the Word of God in truth. You don't add to it. You don't take away from it. And so they're saying to him, you're an individual that we can, we can trust because you teach rightly. But they're also saying, and you do not show personal favoritism. In other words, you're not swayed by threats. You're not swayed by arguments. You are faithful and you are impartial to all. That's a very important aspect of a person's character. They're saying basically, you are a man who exudes wisdom. You're somebody who is discerning. You are not taken by flattery. You're able to hear both sides and to make a decision that is right. And so you're not somebody who shows partiality when you make your judgments. It's like Proverbs 24, 23, when it says, These things also belong to the wise. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. And that's the absolute truth. It is not good to show partiality in judgment. In judgment, this is something I've taken to heart as a, as a man, uh, as a man who wants to be a, a strong Christian, to try and to hear things in a fair way and not to show partiality, not to say, well, this is my friend, this is my, my brother, this is my wife, my child, you know, and, and therefore blood is thicker than water, whatever it is, I'm going to believe them. I, I'm not quite like that. I actually learned that from my mom because my mom told me when I was a kid, you know, quite a few years ago now, my mom has said, uh, you know, well, David, when somebody says to me that you did something bad, she said, uh, I'll tell them I don't doubt it. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. But she'd say, I don't doubt it. He probably t he does worse, you know, than what you've seen. And, and she was right in that. The point she obviously was making is, you know, truth really must prevail. And, and every human being is capable of doing wrong. And, and just because you're my son doesn't mean that I'm going to back you in everything. Because if you're wrong, you're wrong. And we have to deal with what is wrong. Not everybody does that. There's quite a number of people who say, was well, my kid right or wrong? You see, there was a time years ago now, of course, that, that if uh, somebody's kid did something wrong and a neighbor brought the kid to the parent and said, I'm sorry, but your kid was just cussing or your kid just beat up my, my, my son or, or whatever, you know, the parent of the kid who had done wrong would, would thank the neighbor 
for actually caring enough to let them know how bad the kid, their kid had been, and then they would take that kid into the house and, and they would deal with them. That's the way it was. It used to be that way, not anymore. Now, if you approach somebody, there's a good chance if you approach them and say, I'm sorry, but your kid was just using some pretty foul language, they might cuss at you too. <laughs> so, you know, I mean, they defend their kid, you know, their kid's right or wrong, and that's just not the way to do things because truth has to prevail. And, and that's basically what they're saying here. They're saying, we know that you're somebody who is not partial in your judgment. We know that you teach the Word of God rightly. You're an individual who is known for having integrity, and uh, because of that, uh, we think we can ask you a question. But in reality, what they're doing is they're setting a trap for him. And notice what the trap is. In verse 22, they say, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar or not? That's their trap. When they say, is it, is it lawful for us to pay taxes to Caesar? It's another way of saying, is it lawful for us as religious Jews occupied by a foreign nation to pay taxes to pagan Romans? It really has a religious base to it. They had to give taxes. The Jews would give a tax of one-tenth of their grain. They'd give one-fifth of the wine and oil. They'd give one percent of their income tax as wage earners. And as they did so, the tax would be used to support Roman troops that was occupying, that were occupying the nation of Israel. And that made their taxing of the Jews a very hated thing. They hated that tax. Because think about it, they were paying for an invading army to remain in occupation in their country. How would you like to do that here? How would you like it? I wouldn't like it if a nation invaded the United States overthrew us, and I have to pay my tax money to keep their soldiers guarding me and my family. It would be something that I think most Americans would hate too, and the Jews hated it. The Jews hated it tremendously. It was a hated tax. As a matter of fact, hatred for that tax sparked a revolt in A.D. 6, and it's even referred to in the book of Acts. It's found in Acts chapter 5, verse 37, when, when one of the teachers of Israel, a man by the name of Gamaliel, said this. He said, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. He perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. He's referring to a, a riot, a, an, a, an uprising that took place over this hated tax. And so the Jews hated the tax. For them, it was a perfect question. You see, the reason it's a great question to ask is this. If, if Jesus says, pay the tax, he alienates the Jewish population. The Jews hate that tax, so they're going to reject him. But if he says, don't pay the tax, now he's going to be accused of rebellion against Rome, and he can be arrested. And so he's, they think that they have him on the horns of a dilemma. Funny thing about this whole thing is the Herodians supported the tax and the Pharisees rejected it. And so they bring this question that even they fight over to the Lord Jesus Christ. But notice how it says here in verse 23, as they have asked that question, is it lawful? Well, verse 23, he perceived their craftiness. And he said to them, why do you test me? Perceiving their craftiness is another way of saying he knew their hypocrisy. In other words, he saw through them. Proverbs 1.17 says, Surely in vain the net is spread in the sight of any bird. Psalm 44.21 says, He knows the secrets of the heart. And Hebrews 4.13 says, There's no creature hidden from his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom we must give account. Jesus saw right through them. He saw right through the insincerity of that question. There have been times when even I, as just a regular guy, have had somebody approach me and, and uh, ask me a question, and sometimes they've used flattery. As a matter of fact, often they have. Oh, pastor, I know that you'll tell me the truth if I ask. And then they'll ask a question that they're trying to entrap me with. It's happened many times in my ministry, and, and I find it interesting, you know. There have been times that I actually got to the point where I would ask, do you want an honest answer to that, or are you trying to start an argument? If you want an honest answer, I can give you an honest answer if you want one. Or is it an argument that you want? Because if it's an argument that you want, I'm not going to argue with you. 
But if you're asking a sincere question, then I'm more than willing to give you an honest, sincere answer. But it's up to you. Are you wanting to start an argument or are you wanting an answer to a question? Which is it going to be? And I have to be honest with you because you can see through those things. Sometimes people say, well, I think, and then they're going to tell me what they think, and then we've saved me having to try and answer a question that was really a setup. And then I can let them give me the sermon, take an offering, I don't give, and then they leave, you know. And that's basically the way it is, kind of like you guys, but that's, <laughs> I'm just teasing, kind of. No, I'm just teasing. So how does he respond? He says, why do you test me? Show me a denarius. Whose image and inscription does it have? And they answered and said, Caesar's. And so what he does is he actually, and I want you to see this, he actually openly confronts them. This is not being done in secret. This is being done in open. This isn't just Jesus and some people in a private discussion. There are people around. And so he openly exposes their hypocrisy. He publicly confronts them for testing him. You see, this is something, sadly, that in the nation of Israel's history, their forefathers were guilty of. Their, their forefathers had been guilty of testing the Lord. As a matter of fact, in Psalm 95, verse 9, God says, your fathers tested me. They tried me, though they saw my work. You're not to test the Lord thy God, and yet this is what they're doing. They're testing him. They're trying him. And so Jesus confronts them first, and he asks them, why are you testing me? Why do you intend to try and, uh, and uh, cause me to, to stumble and to do something that is wrong? Why are you doing that? But then he goes on and says, show me a denarius. A denarius is a Roman coin. It was the one that was acceptable for the particular tax that they were speaking about. When you would look at a denarius, on one side was an engraving of the emperor, and on the other side was an engraving of Caesar sitting on a throne in priestly robes being designated as a high priest. And, and because at that time it was common for emperors to claim to be divine, they would even refer to themselves as God's son. And, and and so it, this was a coin that the, the, the religious Jews hated because it was idolatrous and it was blasphemous. But he says, show me a coin. And they have one and they show it. And he asks the question, whose image and inscription does it have? Well, they answer and they say, well, it's Caesar's. So they're waiting with bated breath because if he denounces Caesar, we now have a basis of an accusation. We can now form a charge. We can take it to the governor, and we can get Jesus Christ put to death. They're not expecting the answer that he gives there, though, because in verse 25, he said to them, Render, therefore, to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. They didn't expect that, I promise you. His answer, simply put, is this. It's perfectly legitimate to pay Caesar because the tax is under his domain. And taxes serve a purpose in society because the taxes do things like building roads and ensuring that police are a part of a society that can keep that society safe and orderly. And so he's saying there are things that you do. You pay your taxes because there's a, a place for that. In other words, the state has a right to assess taxes because taxes lie within the sphere of its responsibility. So he says, pay your taxes. And, and I, as an American citizen, bringing this into a 21st century application, I pay my taxes too. I, I pay no less than I'm supposed to, and I do my very best not to pay any more <laughs> than I have to. I will pay my fair share. And so, an application to this is Christians, of all people, ought to be the best of the citizens in the nation. There's no doubt about that. We believers ought to be the best citizens that this nation has. Twenty, when I was 20 years old, I'd gotten saved, and uh, I started going to church. I was going to a small church in Costa Mesa called Calvary Chapel. People today will say, Calvary Chapel, which one? When I got saved, there was only one. And as far as I'm concerned, there still is only one. 
I'm simply associated in fellowship with Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa. When somebody says Calvary Chapel, they ought to think of Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa because Calvary Chapel Costa Mesa is Calvary Chapel. And, and we here in, in Chino Valley have simply been given the privilege and honor of, of being associated in fellowship with Calvary Chapel there in Costa Mesa. It's really that simple. And when I first got saved, I started going to the small church called Calvary Chapel. And um, I was enjoying it. But here was my dilemma. I had an uncle who had invited me to, um, to come and spend some time to, to actually move and to live with him for a while. He sent me a letter and invited me to come, and I had just gotten saved, and I, I really didn't want to go live with my uncle. But he had asked me if I would come. As a matter of fact, he ordered me to come. It was my Uncle Sam. I got drafted. And uh, I, I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go. I didn't want to go into the military, not because I was a pacifist, not because I was a conscientious objector, because I am neither. I didn't want to go into the military at that time because I had just gotten saved. And as I had just gotten saved, I wanted to grow in my faith. And, and I was concerned. I was afraid that were I to go into the military at that time, that, that I wouldn't have any fellowship, I wouldn't have any Bible teaching, I wouldn't have the things that I was just beginning to acquaint myself with that were becoming very valuable to me, and I was concerned about that. And, and you see, I had been drafted to go into the military, as many of you know, because I've shared this before, I had been drafted to go into the military August 25th, 1970. That was the date I was supposed to report for active duty. I had received this draft notice, and it said, you are hereby ordered to report for active duty on August 25th, 1970 and all. And and I had uh, appeared uh, at that time there in Los Angeles at the induction center and, and had gone in. But because I had, at the age of 18, I had burglarized a jewelry store in the Whittier Quad. I had taken a, a crowbar and actually a tire iron and, and I had busted open a, uh, a glass uh, window at a jewelry store there that was at the Quad. I had gotten arrested for that, and that being a felony offense, uh, it had been <clears throat> on my record. Though I did know that it had been basically expunged because I had gone to court and my dad had hired a, an expensive lawyer by the name of Stanley Brown out of Beverly Hills who continued sending me Christmas cards for years, hoping that I was going to get in trouble and remember good old Stanley. Uh, but uh, he... Uh, yeah, that's the truth. But uh, I knew that, that that had been dealt with. But see, uh, when I went into the induction center, they didn't. And so the, um, the individual there that I was speaking to said, we have discovered that you have a record. Your record is a felony. We have two options. One is we can, we can induct you and just work it and clear it now, or we can uh, send you an, another notice to appear and, uh, you know, and um, you can leave. And he said, so which is it? And I smiled and I laughed, of course. I, I wasn't a believer. I said, you got to be kidding. He said, I'm out of here. And, and I laughed. And, and I've shared this with you before. My dad had given me some money. He gave me $10. And, and it just so happens that that day, and another guy, a friend of mine, his name was Gary, had also, because he had a, a criminal offense on his record, he had been released. So he and I together were released, but we didn't have a ride home. Well, it turns out that Gary was carrying with him uh, some grass, some marijuana, and I had 10 bucks. And so we stepped out, smoked some pot, went and got some breakfast. I called a friend of mine. He came and picked me up, dropped me off at my house. And so once again, I came staggering into the house. Not really staggering. I didn't stagger when I was loaded on grass. I just kind of walked in, and I was high. And my dad sees me, and my dad says, what are you doing home? And, and I said to him, well, even the army doesn't want me. And I started laughing, and I went into my room, and, and I continued going downhill. That was in August of 1970. I didn't get saved until December. And so every month, I started getting these letters from, from my uncle. You are hereby ordered to report for active duty September so-and-so. And I wrote him a letter, and, and I say, no. Nope. I said, I've got a doctor's appointment, because I found out you could do that. And so they sent me another letter in October. You are hereby ordered to report for active duty. Nope, got to go to court. And I just started making up lies. And I just, I had a pen pal, an uncle that I would write, you know, every month. <laughs> and I would say, nope, 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 nope. And I kept doing that. I kept doing that till December. And, and because I knew they weren't going to come to get me. I knew that. They'll just keep writing me. And I wasn't going. Then I got saved. And now I'm in a quandary. What am I going to do? You know, I am now a believer. 
but I don't want to go in. I don't know what to do. And as a new believer, I began to wrestle. What should I do? Should I go into the military? Should I not? And uh, of all things, I was at my aunt's house and uh, watching TV, and she happened to have, uh, well, on the TV, on the program that day was Sergeant York, of all things. So I'm watching Sergeant York, and I'm enthralled by this because it turns out that he was a Christian. And he has the option of going into the military or choosing to be a conscientious objector. And he goes off someplace in the movie to, to pray and seek the Lord. And the answer comes to him, render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's and unto God the things that belong to God. And that is the scripture that Sergeant Alvin York, the most highly decorated um, individual from the 82nd uh, in World War I, that's what got him into the military in the first place. And so when that happened, I, I, I thought, you know, the Lord has given me an answer. Render unto Caesar the things that belong to Caesar and to God the things that belong to God. And that's why I made a choice to go into the military. And so what I ended up doing is volunteering. They called it volunteering for the draft. I volunteered for the draft. I chose my induction date, March 15th, 1971, and I went into the service. And that's how that worked. Because I did believe, and I do believe, that the Scriptures are very practical. I do owe the government that I have freedoms under. I do owe them certain things. And I owe God certain things. And so that's how I made my choice. And so, as a Christian, I want to be a good citizen. And as a good citizen, I understand something as a Christian good citizen, and that is I know who is in ultimate control of all things. You see, I know that human government is one of the three foundational building blocks that God has given to, to humanity, to civilization, to society. Within nine chapters in the very first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis, within nine chapters you find three building block institutions that are established by God. You have marriage, you have the church, and you have human government. And human government is found in Genesis chapter 9, when it says at verse 6, whoever sheds man's blood, by man his blood shall be shed. For in the image of God he made man. That's the first reference to man having to enact judgment for certain offenses. Human government is established in chapter 9. And then when you study in, in the New Testament, you look at Romans 13, for example, where the Apostle Paul says everyone must submit himself to the governing authorities. There is no authority except that which God has established. The authorities that exist have been established by God. God is the one who ordains human government. He goes on in Romans 13, verses 5 through 7 to say, Therefore, it is necessary to submit to the authorities not only because of possible punishment, but also because of conscience. This is also why you pay taxes. For the authorities are God's servants who give their full time in governing. Give everyone what you owe him. If you owe taxes, pay taxes. If revenue, then revenue. If respect, then respect. If honor, then honor. Paul isn't the only person who refers to that because the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 13 through 15 says something similar. He says, Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every authority instituted among men whether to the king as the supreme authority or to governors who are sent by him to punish those who do wrong and commend those who do right. For it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. Human government has been ordained by God. Now, some people say, well, is it ever right to, to um, resist human government? And the quite, quite obviously the answer is yes. There are times when even as the apostle said, Peter said, you know, um, whether it is right to obey you or, or God, you decide, but we will uh, obey God. There are times when laws are passed that are unjust, and therefore there would be a righteousness in resisting that which is wrong. And there are times when we do resist that which is wrong. Many, many years ago now, uh, I had an opportunity to go into China in the 80s, and um, I took a team with me, and, and we brought in suitcases of Bibles, suitcases of them, because in China, even to this day, there's a restriction on the availability of, of Bibles in Chinese, and, and, and yet the Chinese government uh, restricts the freedom of religion, 
And um, these believers, many people didn't even have a Bible. I mean, we were aware of churches that, that, that in, in uh, churches of several hundred, they had one Bible. And what they would do is they actually would take that Bible, they still do it, they would take the Bible apart piece by piece, page by page, and they would actually uh, give it to members of the church who would hold on to those pages because they only had one. And when the pastor's putting together a message, he actually asks for them to come and bring the page that they have so he can use that for his message and preparation. We were aware of that and many things like that. And so I was asked if I wanted to come and bring some Bibles to Christians who did not have the ability to read the Scriptures. Now, somebody said in our church, some people got upset, well, you're breaking the law. Well, I believe that God's law, as it pertains to the things that relate to freedom to understand and know Him, are, are greater than man saying you can't know Him. And, and we're not going to let you bring this Bible in. And so we smuggled Bibles in. And I didn't have any conscience that was negative towards that at all. I felt I was doing God a service, and I felt I was doing a service to those believers who didn't have a Bible. See, we Americans have so many Bibles. Uh, we can have several. I have at least seven to ten Bibles of my own. We have Bibles. We all have Bibles. All of us do. More Bibles than you can imagine. You can go into our bookstore, and you know this, and you can stay there for an hour trying to pick out the right one. And then, then once you finally found the, the version or translation, what color do I want it to be? You know what I'm saying? I mean, we are, we are, we are so rich in this, but, but these people aren't. And, and so I had no problem with that at all. And, and I appeal to the fact that, that there are times that you obey God rather than man. All times you obey God rather than man. And so that's something that I have conscience towards and I'm aware of. Yes, we honor government until it begins to impose itself on us in the worship of God and in the exercise of our conscience towards him. Now, to try and become a little practical, um, again, it's an uh, election year. I can say a few things. Uh, not to t you know, I'm not going to tell you who to vote for, and you know that. But I do think it is something that I, that I, I cherish, I relish, it's something I do. I, I encourage all of us in here to take part in that. And what we do is we have the opportunity here in the United States to vote. And we do so as part of what would be called an orderly process of governing society. That's why we vote. And so I, I do cast my vote in, and, and I look very carefully at, at the candidates. And as I do so, um, I know this. I know that no candidate, whether uh, he's from one party or another, Democrat, Independent, Republican, doesn't matter, no candidate is going to 100% reflect the things that I believe and hold most dear. Not one is going to. And I'm aware of that, and so are you. But I, I feel a responsibility to cast a vote. How do I do that? How do I make that choice? How do I make that decision? Well, I see it as a moral choice. So I spend time looking at candidates' records. I, I look at a variety of things that they believe and do, what their track record is, etc. But I especially like to concentrate on issues that are moral. And, and so I try to determine certain things. I, I try to determine if I perceive them to have... Uh, some honesty about them? Do they have stability uh, in their judgment? Are they mature? Are they experienced? Are, are they in line uh, pretty much with, with the views that I hold? Uh, I begin to ask questions. I, uh, I don't vote. I'm not one who votes just a party, though I have a registered party I belong to. I, I don't feel any, any compulsion whatsoever, compunction at all, to have to always vote that ticket, and I don't. I, I vote the, the candidate that most reflects what I believe. And, and so I ask questions, uh, and I ask moral questions. Uh, I, I want to know how they stand on various things, of course. I, I want to know how they stand on issues of economy, of course, and, and, and military. Those are quite obvious, those kinds of things. Um, but I also ask questions of, of them, like, uh, what, what is their stand on, on, on partial birth abortion? How do they feel about abortion in general? Um, what do they feel about, about education? Are they encouraging parents to decide where their kids go to school? How do they stand on issues that relate to that? I, I look at their moral issues. Do they support and endorse uh, homosexual movement? Are they in favor of homosexual marriage? Do they, do they, uh, do they restrict people from the right of freedom of speech by, by, by um, endorsing um, things like, like legislation uh, that relates to what is called hate speech? Because I know that if you can pass certain legislation that relates to hate speech, then you've opened up Pandora's box. You've opened up uh, something, a slippery slope has now been entered into because 
if you can penalize a person for calling somebody else a certain name to the point of imprisoning them, I also know that you can tell a pastor that he cannot preach the Word of God as it pertains to things like issues of homosexuality. I know that, and I've seen that it's already true in, in countries such as Sweden, where they imprisoned a, for 30 days a pastor who gave a study on, on uh, homosexuality and said God is opposed to it. They said it's a form of hate speech, and he was put in jail for 30 days. I know that in Canada, they ban teaching of, of, uh, against in opposition to homosexuality because they say it's a form of hate speech. And I also know that um, there are those of religious persuasion, such as Islam, that are actually encouraging that kind of legislation because if that legislation is passed, then if I speak as a Christian pastor and say Islam has incorrection, is incorrect or wrong, then they could possibly use that against me, say that I am hateful towards their religious beliefs and I could be fined or put in jail. These are the things that are taking place right now and I'm aware of those things. And we need to be too. I know that the next president of the United States is going to probably appoint two or three Supreme Court just justices. I know that. I know that there are some justices right now who are very old and waiting to retire, but they're waiting to see who's elected as the next president because Supreme Court justices continue in office until they voluntarily retire or they die. And they do not want certain judges to be placed in there. And the next president of the United States is going to be loading the benches with judges. I'm aware of that. And I also know that though we have a, a form of government that is divided into three basic fundamental blocks, I know that the judiciary is actually superseding the other areas of government. I know that because they are the ones that are having laws passed that, um, that are restricting my speech or attempting to restrict my freedom of religion and conscience. I'm aware of those things, and I know that the next president who's going to be in office is going to be uh, supplying us with new justices who are going to be more than likely activists who are going to be presenting not, not, the, not the constitutionality of, of, uh, of law, but rather they're going to be bringing in their idea, their take, their spin, and they, through the law, are going to change the moral tone of the United States. I'm aware of these things, and so should you be. And that's what informs me when I involve myself in the political process. I render unto Caesar the things that are Caesar's, but I also render unto God the things that belong to God. And I make sure that I'm aware of those things. You see, on the one hand, I'm aware of what government is. I know how it is established and how it runs. But I also know, as Jesus said, that I'm not to withhold from God what belongs to him. And so the point he's simply making here is pay your taxes to Caesar, but reserve your worship for God. You see, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 20, Paul said, you were bought at a price, therefore honor God with your body. You were saved, honor God, and you do so with all that is within you. Now, as this is taking place, notice verse 26, they could not catch him in his words in the presence of the people, and they marveled at his answer, and they kept silent. They marveled. Jesus saw right through them. And when he confronted that, when he was able to extricate himself from their trap, when he nimbly dealt with it, brought conviction to them and awareness to them that they weren't about to outsmart God, when that happened, all they could do, and it was the wisest thing they could do, by the way, is just to keep silent. Because you just can't out-argue God. You can't win the argument with him. There have been times when my kids, they don't do this any longer, but when they were younger, and their teens especially, Marie and I were blessed to have four kids who were teenagers at the same time. Four teenagers. If you don't believe in hell, <laughs> four teenagers. Man, that was, that was one rough season. And, and my kids are very much like me. They speak their mind. I wish they took after their mama, but they don't. Not in that. They would speak their mind. And I, as a father, have this tendency of saying, well, what's on your mind? Let me know. I, I prefer knowing rather than you walking around the house with that ugly face of yours. Don't give me those ugly faces. Anybody ever say that? Don't make a face. Don't be making that face. What's on your mind? 
you know, and so they've always had the freedom to talk to me, and I let them, and, and I have no problem with that still to this day. If they, they want to come, they can vent, they can say what they want, dad will listen. But there were times, there were times when I would put the hand up, and they know what that means. It means you're one step from the grave. <laughs> I would raise my hand. And I'd say um, something like this. I'd say, that's enough. It's enough. No, but I'd say, no, no, this is where this begins something, to be something else. At this point, don't become confused. This is not a conversation. Because a conversation requires two people communicating and both listening. This is a monologue. I'm speaking, you're listening. And then go, you know, how mean. And I say, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Do you want sympathy? Right, dear Abby. <laughs> you, because this is dad speaking, and, and, and this is not a conversation. So don't get confused. See, this is, this is, this is what you're going to do. You know, there are times, and, and those are few and far between, and, and I actually did that. I actually did. I'd say, no, no more, no conversation. This is me talking to you. This is what you're going to do. I'm your dad. You're going to listen. That's the way it is. Listen to you long enough, tired of hearing you. This is what you're going to do. It's over. No more. Stop. And this is how it's going to be. That's what dads do, and that's what I would do. You know what? My heavenly father does the same thing. This isn't a conversation. You listen to what I'm saying, and it's time for you to be quiet. I think it's an amazing thing that we actually think that we can argue with God, but there's this old saying, your arms are too short to box with God. <laughs> and it's true. When God has something that he's saying, it's wiser for me to listen. Don't you think it's wiser to listen? It is. Because especially my kids, if they kept spouting off, I would tell them, you know, you know you're really putting yourself in a bad position because the more you talk, the more problems you're going to have. It's really wiser for you to stop about this point here. You've already dug a hole so deep, you're not going to get out of it for a week. You continue doing that, man. You know what? Stop it. It's time to stop. We who parent, our parents who are involved in our, our kids' lives, we actually do things like that because we love them, not because we're mad at them and hate them, because we love them and it's enough. We have to lay down the law. Well, you know what? God does that too. And but we think we can argue with him. We think we can instruct him. We think we can tell him what he's supposed to do and how he's supposed to do it. And when he doesn't do it, we get mad at him. We, we hold our breath and we pout and we're very angry because we just don't understand. And so you see a, a godly man like Job, and you see him in the first chapter how God is speaking to Satan, how, how Satan is going to and fro throughout the earth, and he's, and he's up to no good. And God asks Satan, what have you been up to? And he says, I've been looking around. And God says, hmm, have you considered my servant Job? And he says, yeah, but you put a hedge about him. I can't touch him. What have you been doing? God is speaking as an interrogator. He is interrogating an individual and calling that person, Satan, to have to give an account of his behavior, his actions. That's what that's all about. God being God, Satan being Satan, God calls him into account. What have you been up to? I've been going to and fro. When he says, I've been going to and fro, it's another way of saying, I've been up to no good. I've been looking for something. I've been, I've been prowling. That's what it is. He's a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so in Job, we see that. What I, I've been going to and fro. I've been throughout the earth. Mm. Okay, that means you've been looking around. Have you considered? Have you weighed? Have you looked at closely? Have you found a weakness in my servant Job? That's what it means when he says, have you considered my servant Job? Of course, God knows that he did. So Satan says, well, yeah, I've been looking for a weakness. I've been looking for some kind of weakness in his, in his life. Yes, I have. I've considered him, and I've come to realize that no matter what I try to do, I can't touch him because you have put something around him. You've got a hedge of protection about him. But you know what? If you were to, if you were to take his wealth, chapter 1, if you were to take his health, chapter 2, he will curse you to your face. Yeah, you put a hedge about him. I can't touch him, but I can tell you there are two things that matter to Job because these are the two things that matter to humanity in general, health and wealth. My dad, when I was growing up, said, son, take care of your health because you got to work. If you don't take care of your health, you can't go to work, you can't pay your bills. What was my dad teaching me? The same thing yours probably taught you. You have to have health in order to have wealth. 
That's right out of the Bible. And Satan knew it. And he says, yeah, you touch his health. You touch his wealth. You touch those things, and the result is going to be he will curse you to your face. And so what happens? God says, you can touch him, but you can't kill him. We know the story of Job. Before you know it, this most honored man in the East is sitting in dust and ashes. He has broken piece of pottery, scraping his, his, his diseased skin. Well, the children are singing songs about him and, and are ridiculing him. And in great misery, he is there suffering to the point where his loving wife says, curse God and die. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate your advice. <laughs> Not today. Shall we receive only good from the hand of God and not evil. In all these things, he did not sin against God with his lips. So, what happens? Here comes his buddies, Job's comforters. They sat with him for several days, remained silent. The best thing they could have done is just be quiet, but nope. They have to start giving him advice. You're not getting as much as you should get. You're worse than you think. And off they go. Job, you deserve everything. Now, Job isn't going to put up with that, and he doesn't. So he begins to argue. Finally, he says, I wish I had a mediator, a daysman. I wish I had somebody to go between God and me. I could plead my case, and I could succeed, because I have been unjustly placed in this position. And we read the book of Job up into right around chapter 40 or so, right in that area, when Job says, or rather God decides it's time to break into Job's life in a personal way. And he says, Job, I got a few things to ask you. You've been asking me a lot of questions. Now it's my turn to ask you. Gird yourself like a man and answer me. And then you find a series of questions in the book of Job. Where were you when I placed the stars where I placed them? Where were you when I told the sea and the waves to stop there at the shore and to go no further? Uh, if you know these things, please instruct me. And God begins to ask a series of questions to Job. If you know so much, answer the simplest questions, Job. Well, can he? Of course he, he can't. What happens? We know the story. I put my hand over my mouth, he says to the Lord, and, and I will be silent. He said, I have heard of you with the hearing of mine ear, but now I have seen you with the seeing of my eye and I abhor myself. I humble myself before you, for I have spoken wrongly. The best thing that you can ever do is just be quiet. Just let God do what God does. And when Jesus spoke and he said, answer me, and gave that answer to them, and gave that, show me a denarius, and he says, render to Caesar. They, they couldn't deal with this. You see, in Job 5, verses 12 and 13, it says, He thwarts the plans of the crafty so that their hands achieve no success. He catches the wise in their craftiness, and the schemes of the wily are swept away. They marvel at his answer, and they're quiet, because you can't out-argue God. And Jesus pointed that out very clearly. 